Welcome, everyone, to our Artist Professional Development Workshop tonight. Thanks so much to Primary Colors for partnering with us, the Arts Council. I'm Shannon Linker with the Arts Council, and this is Jesse Spate with the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And I am going to let you give them a little bit of your background uh -huh. and take it from there. Okay, good. Thanks. Well, welcome. I feel like you're at my home. I've been coming to this museum since I was about this big. And I thought it would be a great place to work and look where I am. I, I've been here since just after the Civil War. <laughs> I got my discharge papers and I thought I needed them. Uh, I, I really have been here a long time, um, 29 years. And uh, it's a really great place to work. Uh, I have a lot of fun every day. So we're going to talk about some of the stuff I do. Uh, I was uh, telling Shannon earlier that this is a real shift in gears for me. Because working for the art museum is kind of like working for NASA, where you don't really think about how much this costs so much as you think about how can we do this the best way possible. So uh, I'm not going to drive you crazy with things that cost a million dollars to pack, OK? I'm going to talk about a, a wide variety of things. We'll talk about the Cadillacs, but we're going to talk about the uh, you know, bicycles as well. So we'll try to talk about everything in between so that we have uh, an, an idea of uh, what's what. Now money is an issue, I know that, because I get calls all the time and people say, you know, I've got this thing and it's pretty valuable and I want it to go from here to there and I don't want to spend any money. Uh, so can you help me? <laughs> well, you know, I, I got a silver bullet. There it is, you know, and uh, that's the answer. Well, you know, if I had a silver bullet, then we'd have to talk about the cost of silver. Uh, it, it would be too expensive. So, you know, a better uh, question or answer is to uh, think about, you know, what, what do you want your package to do? Because each is an individual thing. Uh, I, I think of what we do here at the museum as medicine. Uh, a lot of what I do is preventive medicine. You know, I make sure the artwork eats its vegetables and goes to sleep on time and uh, does all the things, you know, stop smoking. We want the artwork to live a long life. And so that's the kind of thing I do. Now we have a department down the hall, conservation. They're like the doctors in the emergency room. When artwork uh, gets sick or if it's in a bad accident, you know, or geriatric sit in, then we take it down to the doctors. But that, my job is to make sure it doesn't get to that point. So that's my approach. And, and so how, how can I best take care of the health of, of these individual objects. And to do that, I have to know the objects intimately because everything has its own strengths and weaknesses, right? And, and so, you know, that can be your approach too. Regardless of, of your budget, uh, you can know your artwork, you can know uh, your antique, your artifact, whatever it is, and uh, you can make some informed decisions uh, based on, on that. And you also know, need to know the possibilities and the limitations of the products that are out there. Because that will, these are the kinds of things we're gonna look at. But we also need to understand our enemies. And the enemies of artwork in transit include shock and vibration, rapid changes in climate. That includes not only temperature, but relative humidity as well. Uh, water, of course, is an enemy. And, uh, the, the one that is most interesting to me is human error. Uh, human error can cause us a lot of problems. And it's one of the most difficult uh, to deal with. So you have all these ideas and all these approaches. And what it amounts to is you have a design project in front of you. And because packing is, uh, in the end, uh, a, a manner of design. And your success or failure will depend on your design. Um, you can use good materials with poor technique or vice versa. Poor materials with a good technique and you know you're going to be in trouble. And so uh, the thing to do is to uh, use right materials the right way. It's uh, my little motto there. So one of the things that uh, I keep in mind is, is something that a packer told me when I first started 
um, he'd been packing for about 10 years, and he, and he said, you know, every time art moves, it dies a little. And the thing we need to do is, is to mitigate that and, and to minimize that so that it doesn't die a lot. Uh, and, and like medicine, you know, our aim should be first, do no harm. So you don't want to use materials that actually are harming the artwork. You know, you're trying to hold off that, that problem and to, and to mitigate that thing. So uh, first, do no harm is, is uh, an approach that uh, helps us aim in the right direction, too. It's not just a matter of getting it from here to there. That's a big part of the challenge. Because someone has to do something with it when it gets there, right? Mark, you, you've uh, received packages of all sorts, I'm sure. And you know that it can range quite a bit. Uh, varieties of spice of life, right? And then, uh, you know, you, you see it all uh, after all the years I've worked here. I have seen it all, I think. I hope. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to look at some successes and failures. Uh, but. Uh, there's a, there's a saying about packing that I really like, and it's that you, your goal should be to make your package foolproof. The problem with that is fools are so ingenious. Uh, my goodness, that's the human error. Uh, you know, um, I, I try to picture in my mind who, who my target is, and uh, one of my coworkers covered this up, and I almost forgot it. Um, because we were doing some cleaning today. But uh, I have in mind the person that's going to unpack my package. And I'd like to think in my mind, maybe this is the stupidest person I've ever met. Maybe this is the, the person who all those sayings are about, you know, that he's you know, one brick shy of a load and that sort of thing. And so he, he, in my mind, he looks something like this. Uh, his coworkers got him this t-shirt and he doesn't know what it means. Uh, He's definitely not a rocket scientist. This guy has some problems. And if I can design for him, then my design is going to be okay, all right? And so what I do is I hope for the best, but I plan for the worst. And there he is. So that's my goal. That's my guy. That's who I'm, I'm designing for. And I figure yeah, I have to make this simple. I have to make this uh, in a way that... Uh, it's readily understood because I, a lot of times I deal with language barriers. So uh, that gets into uh, the, the uh, quotient as well. And so, you know, clarity and uh, um, ease of use, those kinds of things are important to me. And if it's going to be reused or not. Because if, if I need this person to turn this package around and send it back to me, I want him to do it exactly like we planned it. And so being able to take it apart is one thing, being able to put it back together is another. Think of that when you're designing your package. Um, you also uh, want to th think, of, think about the type of carrier you're going to use. Uh, is it you? You know, if you're going to hand deliver it, that's one thing. That's okay. That works. Uh, you can, you're going to use a, a fine art shipper. Uh, I gave a list to Shannon, and it was kind of over the top, maybe. Uh, it's from our registrar, so it's in incredibly detailed, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it covers uh, a lot of ground, but it's it's almost all uh, fine art shippers, and I know that that may be out of most people's budget. Uh, and so, you know, are you going to use a bulk carrier? Uh, well, you know, that's probably the way most of us go, uh, because that's that's the way uh, most of our budgets work. So. Um, Bulk carriers are interesting. I mean, that you know, people that handle a lot of freight, and uh, you can can picture in your mind your package in one of these rooms. Uh, there are a lot of packages there. One of them is precious to you. Uh, how precious is it to the guy that has to move all those? How much time can he spend looking at it, reading what you've written on the outside? Uh, you know. You need to think about that. Uh, as we go through this series, you know, I, I'm, I'm not selling any products, I'm not uh, selling any uh, services or anything. And so, uh, you know, don't get me wrong on any of this. It all can work. It, everything that we're talking about can work. But you need to keep in mind what you're doing to be realistic about it. 
if, uh, if your package is in there and it says do not stack, well, which one is it? Uh, maybe it's being stacked. So you need to think that way. Plan for the worst and expect the best. But if you, if you are planning for the worst things possible to happen, then you're going to be prepared rather than surprised. It's always better to be prepared than surprised, right? So the uh, uh, idea that uh, you, you write on the box and you tell people what you want to happen with it is uh, important in, mainly in terms of claims. <laughs> Um, you know, this side up, uh, we put it on every crate we send out here. Fragile, you know, keep dry, those things. And whether someone reads it or not, we don't know. Um, the uh, uh, handling of, of products, uh, when you have a million to do before you go home, uh, sometimes looks like this. Uh, you've got a, a lot of people <laughs> moving a lot of things. and. You know, these people don't have time, do they, to straighten everything up the way the arrow says? They've got a, a, a job. They've got things to do. They've got, uh, you know, a lot of product to move. So the best thing is to always plan for every side of your package to be the bottom. Because at some point in its life, every side will be its bottom. Uh, a uh, guy that works in Philadelphia that does what I do, was shipping uh, an exhibition of uh, Hindu art. And most of you are familiar with the, the figure, I don't know the name, but it stands on one foot and it has like 15 arms or something like that. So you've got all this weight on one little pinpoint. As a packer, that's a challenge. Because, man, it doesn't take much to break that off. And it's out of metals that are made, I mean, who knows what kind of situation. Uh, maybe flaws in there that are just ready to give way. So he planned for his crate to be substantial no matter which way it was turned because he had this pivot point that was concerning to him. Well, it, it went to India. That's where the exhibition was going. And things were a little different there than they are here. Uh, they took it off the plane. They put it on a train. We don't use trains very much for artwork in this country, but trains are the lifeblood of India. So the train get to the town where the show's going to be. They didn't have a dog, they didn't have a forklift. These things are heavy. These crates were big. And they didn't know what to do with it, you know? I mean, this, you know, what are we, what are we gonna do? So they had some piles of gravel up there in the depot mm. that were just about the right height. Oh. So they rolled the train up to the piles of gravel push these crates off of there and let them roll down to the truck. Not one thing was broken. And the reason is, he didn't care, he put this side up, but as a designer, he didn't care about this side. He, he was thinking, if it turns this way, where do I support it? If it turns that way, how can I hold that in place? So, you need to think in the round, all right? Because this side up is just something nice to say, really. Okay? <laughs> You know, and, and it, you know, that's, I know, that's all I'm going to say. So you need to know really well the strengths and weaknesses of your object. Uh, if you're going to make a design that works no matter which way it's up, you have to understand it, right? And uh, I don't know what kind of uh, materials you guys use. I see a lot of different kinds of materials. You know, there's the tra traditional... Rembrandt kind of portrait on the panel, and it's you know, it's made to last for a million years, and it's lasting. Uh, but then we get a lot of contemporary stuff too. So I, you know, I see things like buckets of blood and uh, you know uh, feathers and uh, plant material and found objects and staples and all that sort of thing. And so that's an aspect that I have to take into consideration. Uh, if you're shipping feathers and plant materials, by the way. You need to get in touch with uh, wildlife. Uh, what is it? Uh, you know the people that govern uh, that sort of thing. Because some of the things you can't export, and you can't import as well. Uh, so there are restrictions on that. So if you're making artwork out of things like that, then either keep it domestic or uh, work it out with the, the, the authorities, because that gets in, into it too. Sometimes you can't ship things 
the counterparts made on uh, ivory is one of those things. If you don't have provenance of uh, a certain date, you, you can't ship it around because you know it, it, uh, if it's too new, that means that someone's been poaching. And if it's really old, okay, that, that'll work. But you have to be able to prove how old it is. So, uh, you know about your product, you know about your artwork, you know its condition, you're going to ship it off. Well, what if something happens? What if it gets to the other end and it's got this big thing on it that it didn't have when it was in your home or it was in your studio? What do you do? How do you prove that? Because maybe the person who received it said, it's like that when we got it. What we do at the museum, uh, rather than just debate endlessly, is we do uh, things called condition reports. Uh, this is uh, the frame, and we note every little booger on that frame so that we know how it was when it left here. Uh, this is the painting. And, you know, when you look at that one, they think it's in great shape. When the registrar looks at it, they think that there's all kinds of problems. Never let a registrar look at their artwork, because this is what it'll look like to them. Problem, problem, problem. They know everything, no matter how tiny it is. But when you do that, there's no more he said, she said. It's like, well, look, there's no big knife in it. Now there's a knife in it. Something happened between the time it left here and, and the time you got your hands on it. So, uh, you know, everybody's got to the camera, take a picture of it. You don't have to write all this stuff on there like the registrar does. If you have a picture of it, you know, you, you kind of safeguarded yourself a little bit there. Um, you know, the checklist is good. If you're using uh, uh, multiple pieces, uh, you don't want 10 to be accounted for when you ship 12. So add a checklist. And make sure that you put in the crate, what you said you put in, because that would be a problem too. If you, if you say there are 12, and then two months later you find the other two behind the couch, you know, that's a problem. So put in the crate the checklist and put the items on the checklist in the crate. Uh, diagrams and instructions are good. It helps people. Uh, I do it a lot. Uh, sometimes it has a lot of words on it. Sometimes it's mainly visual. Uh, I try to use language whenever I can. I have uh, a few examples here of uh, some diagrams that I've put in crates in the past. And uh, this one has multiple languages because it was going to uh, Italy, I believe. And, uh, you know, that helps. I mean, most places that we ship to have someone there that speaks English anyway. But I've found that they appreciate the effort. Sometimes I don't get it right. I'm not a linguist. But uh, I do try and check it out. We have a lot of people around the museum that speak languages, but you can Google it nowadays and uh, you, know, you can have the computer do it for you. So, you know, if you can come up with something like that, that's good. Uh, but the main thing I want you to see about this is it, it's sort of a little story that tells how I want the crate to be handled. You know, I want three people on this because of a certain weight problem or you know, you need to back this away rather than to push it over to the side. You know, it tells a story. It helps people understand how best to do this. And our stuff always comes back. So it helps them put it back together the way I, I send it out, you know? And uh, I usually add my contact information on the instructions so that if you're in the heat of battle and you're thinking, I don't know what this guy was talking about, they can send me a message and I can help them through it. So, you, know, you can do that. You can, you can uh, be available and help people take care of your product the way you want it to be taken care of. And uh, everybody be happy. Now, materials. Uh, I've got them all over the place, don't I? We're going to look at uh, some of the materials and uh, uh, think about how, how we can best use that. Now, tape is an interesting thing. I like to talk about tape. I could write a book about tape. <laughs> Nobody would read it, but <laughs> it would, to me it would be entertaining. I, because it's one of those things, everybody, you know, tape, you know, it's simple. I got tape in the house, I'll use that. And uh, so that's what people do. They grab up whatever's in the house and that's what they use. And the results are like, wow, uh, you can't believe it. Uh, you know, 
there are so many things that you could use tape for that are advantageous to you as a packer. Uh, look at all these colors I've got. I can do a lot with those colors. I can color code the boxes. I can have, you know, the red boxes all go here. The blue boxes all go this way, you know? I can tell stories with it with the color of my tape. I can indicate uh, different uh, ups and downs and uh, all that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, one of the things I, I don't like is uh, clear tape. I have this little sad thing of clear tape here. It's not mine. I got it from another department. Uh, I don't like clear tape because it doesn't tell you anything. And uh, who can I have help me out here? This is a package you know, that someone's received and it needs to be opened. So I want to pull that in. Why don't you do that? You just open that up for us and we'll see what kind of artifact is in there. Um, that's got clear tape on it and it's air cap. We all know air cap. And, uh, you know, just pull that right open there. Pull that up. Easy. So, taking a little pressure. Pull on that kind of hard there. Let's rip that up. Yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> Go ahead and roll that back over to me. You see what kind of pressure she's having to put on that? It, it's because it's clear, you know, where, where does it begin? Where does it end? And, you know, all that pressure is going into the artifact. And if you're not pulling on it like that, then what are you going to do? You're going to mm -hmm. cut that thing open because I'm sick of pulling on this, right? Mm -hmm. And so you hack it open. And you're putting somebody in that position when you package like this. Open this one for us and see if that's going to be easier. <laughs> Done. And nothing happened to the coffee cup. You can keep that coffee cup. Uh, <laughs> I used color tape. I tabbed it so that you're not digging at that thing to start it out. Just bend it over a little bit, that's all. And it's easy to pull off. And you're done. It, so it helps the person. And, it, and if you help that person, you're helping your arm. So think of them. Think of the person that's going to have to receive all this stuff. And be nice to to us recently. I mean, after you invited me to speak, and, and this just happened to be like a perfect little story, it's an African staff, which basically is a really fragile stick. And whoever wrapped this up thought it was never going to come out of the packaging. Look at the tape on that. It's, it's, it's worse than that clear tape, uh, because this has filament in it. So you can't even pull that off. And they take it around and around and around six times that way, and then around this way. There was no way to get this out without breaking the artifact. And I did have to cut it up. Now I, I went at it like a doctor, like it was, you know, like a scalpel, and I, and I withdrew the piece this way. But, uh, you know, they just weren't thinking about who was going to receive this and what they were going to do. Uh, it happens. It happens uh, all the time. So I thought it was worth talking about. Something to uh, not do. All right. So styrofoam. Everybody, when you talk about packing foam, everybody says styrofoam. That's the only. It's like uh, Kleenex. You know, it just means foam to most people. But styrofoam is a real thing. It's a polystyrene foam, and uh, it has certain qualities. Uh, I don't have any styrofoam out right now. Uh, it's not one of the products we use. Uh, it has some qualities that are good. It, and there's a certain amount of shock that it'll take. It doesn't rebound very well. You know, if you've ever stepped on a piece of styrofoam, you kind of can tell where you stepped. It doesn't come back. Uh, you know, it rolls around and it turns into dust and that sort of thing. And so, you know, it, it, it's not perfect. Uh, it is readily available. Um, it sometimes can <coughs> cause some static problems. And, Chemistry is important to us at the museum. So things that have any kind of instability in chemistry is something we say about. But you know, we don't let that frighten you. There are uses for it and you can, you can deal with it. And I'll show you a crate a little bit later that has some styrofoam in it. Not one that we made. Um, foam rubber is another one of those things, you know. You don't have styrofoam, you got some foam rubber, don't you? And it's that squeezy stuff. And uh, you know. 
I've, I've got some that it's usually these are polyurethane foams that are referred to as foam rubber. And uh, urethanes are, are good for cushioning. They do have a rebound and uh, they're used for a lot of things. Uh, I think lights came in this and uh, God only knows what came in that. I've had this a long time. Uh, but they can be pretty chemically unstable too. Uh, look at the difference in the color. Spin down. Uh, same with this. This was attached to the lid of a little crate that we received. And you can tell exactly where the artifact was. <laughs> so you put the lid back on the right way. Uh, that kind of chemistry is something we, we're concerned about. So if you're, you're going to send a package and you want it to be in that package for any kind of length of time, um, chemistry might be something to think about. If it's just a quick trip and it's you know, gone and it's going to come back, you know, not so important. I uh, certainly don't want to store your artifact because that can be handy. You got this nice little box for them, they just store it in there. You can, you know, it might not look right when you get punched here. Uh, another one of those products that we all know about and love are these guys. Peanuts. And you can clean those up for the rest of your life because they have static. Look at this. Come out of there, boy. Um, there are all kinds of them. Uh, some of them are uh, super green, you know, they're biodegradable, uh, others are styrofoam and uh, make little crunchy sounds. Uh, there are some problems with this, even though it's really easy to use, I think that's the biggest sale. Because, you know, anybody can use it, you can pour it in there and you're done. Um, it's invisible. When you get a box filled with this, if you don't know specifically what's in it, you don't know what you're digging around in there for. And uh, it can be really problematic. One of the ways to counteract that is if you put these in little pillows, uh, Ziploc bags or something, uh, make little pillows out of it, and you know you get your thing, but you're not digging through the mystery, and uh, you know you have you have a little control over it. You can also put like a floor and a roof inside your box so that you can get some of those out of there and it's not settled because depending on how heavy your object is, you can put a million of these in a the box and by the time it gets there it's going to be on the box. It'll work its way down, especially if, it, if it's sort of tubular or whatever, it you know, uh, works best with flat things. So a uh, box within a box would be good. And we're going to talk a lot about box within a box because that's, that's one of my favorite solutions to a lot of our problems. Um, but you know, they are easy to find. You can get them at every packing store, and they are easy to use. But you know, take a moment or two and think about the poor guy that's got to clean this up. And I'm, I'm going to let one of my helpers clean it up for you. Um, air cap we touched on briefly. Uh, bubble wrap is another uh, word for it, and it's also pretty easy to use. And uh, you know, it, it has the uh, problem of being only good for one good shot. You know, jolt it because what do people do with bubble wrap? Stand there for I don't know what you're talking about. Don't they? Because there's something wrong with us. You can, you can go online and do that virtually. Have you seen that? You, you can put your mouse on there and click and pop that stuff for hours. It's crazy. So, I mean, think about that if you're going to have it go back and forth because. By the time it comes back, maybe there's no air left in it because the whoever received it just couldn't put a pop in it, you know? And uh, so, that, you know, I just had a, a pop. So, uh, okay, enough of that. But uh, there are some other problems in addition to that. Uh, if you put this uh, bumpy sign against your object and there's humidity change along the way, take that away, you can see that pattern on that object. Some of your objects you don't want to rub out because you know you got a, an object that has uh, a surface that needs to be pristine. So you know if you do use it, you probably ought to use a barrier between it and your object, some kind of a wrapping. And, and if you don't have that available, then put the smooth side against it. So if you do have a humidity problem, at least you're not transferring a pattern. One of my favorites is uh, uh, 
I'm not really sure what they call it. I call it catalytic uh, expanding foam because you've got these two materials and they come together and when they get together, this foam grows like something out of a science fiction movie. And uh, you talk about quick. I mean, it's fast. I mean, it, it, it always has names like that, like uh, uh, Instapack and handy pack and quickie pack and let's hurry up and I gotta go somewhere else and, uh, you know it, it looks like this uh, you cover it you know your product with the plastic and you blow this stuff in and it ends and it gets right up against them so you get this nice contour obviously you know this housed the base and you get the two sides on like that um, you know, if you've got really good ventilation and good health uh, care pro uh, insurance, <laughs> go ahead and use it. The MSDS sheets on this are like a book. Uh, so I, I don't use it. Uh, I'd like to live a little longer. But, uh, you know, people do use it, obviously. We've got this base in there. It made it. Uh, I got another base once that used that product. And when I opened the box, I couldn't get it off. You know, let's just lift it off. No big problem. And, and there was the base. Then I pulled and it wouldn't come off. So I, I opened the other end of the box and it wouldn't come off. I, t I cut the box completely away. And I couldn't get it to move. We didn't know what was in there, so I didn't know what the problem was. And so I had to get a scalpel <laughs> and cut through this for only a couple of hours. It didn't take all that. <laughs> uh, and when I finally got it down, to the artifact, I realized what had happened. It was a vase shaped a lot like an hourglass. And they had put the plastic in this direction instead of this direction. So it was keystone in there, and you couldn't pull it off. So you need to use the right product in the right way. Okay, if you're gonna use this stuff, <laughs> think about removing it. Uh, that took me a long time. and. Uh, I've never forgotten it. That was years ago when I first started working here. But uh, it, uh, that old drawing shows up every time I talk to a group because I don't want anyone else to do that. Uh, you know, that can cause some problems. Uh, composite foam, I didn't have any to show you, but uh, there's this great picture online. It looks a lot like this. I had a coworker once refer to it as head sheets, uh, and you can see why. It's got those flex of parts in it. And composite foam is what it sounds like. It's a grouping of a lot of different kinds of foams. And it's kind of colorful. Uh, you see specks of you know, bright reds and pinks and blues and greens and grays. And it's like they swept the floor at a packing department and squished it all together and made this dense foam. If you've got to ship engine blocks, it's probably fine uh, because it's really dense. Uh, but it has some problems. I had to give a deposition about composite foam one time because we received a marble sculpture, beautiful white pristine surface with a big red spot on our head. And what had happened is they put that composite foam directly on the marble. And it wasn't a big shock, it was vibration, one of our enemies. So it vibrated all the way here from wherever it came from. And that red transfer onto it because this stuff is really unstable. It feels almost damp. Uh, the owner wanted to sue the shipper. Imagine that. Because, see, stuff like that happens when money's involved. Uh, and they were just adamant that uh, that shipper had done something wrong. Like drive, like, you know. Uh, so I had to give a deposition that they had made the wrong choice when it came to product. And now they could have used a barrier. That would have helped. They could have used a, a foam without a lot of pigment in it either. And so, you know, there are things uh, that maybe are best uh, used for, for non art objects. And I think composite foam falls into that. Polyethylene is one of those foams that uh, we like a lot. Uh, this product that we that use is uh, Ethifoam. It's its name from. The net can't get in. Can one of you let her in? Her, her card only works for certain hours. At the phone, is that it's so easy to do so many things with. This is not a blow dryer. 
gets really hot, uh, about 500 degrees. It's not that hot right now, I'm not burning my hand. <laughs> It'll get there. Mainly used for stripping paint, but we, we have different uses for it. Um, this stuff is so forgiving and so useful and so easy to work with. I'm surprised sculptors don't use it. Uh, I've made some fake art for training sessions out of this stuff and hang it up and it looks just like bronze stuff. But you can cut it on band saws. You can get a tight cut like that because it'll cut even on the back side of the saw. You don't have to use the, the blade saw. So you can, you can just do all kinds of stuff with this. You can shape it on a sander. You know, make it a nice dome of this pic these pictures here on a sander. And uh, that's great if you're shipping a bowl or something like that that you need to support inside. And uh, it's getting hot now. We don't like to use a lot of glues because of the chemistry of it. So, uh, to keep them together. This stuff is fast. And if you're in a hurry and you don't want to use that uh, Instacut, this is almost as fast. And you can sculpt it and add to it and take away from it and make it fit your product just exactly like you want it to. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a good product to use. And we use it in combination with other things. Uh, and it comes in various sizes. You can see on the table there. You have a three inch block, a two inch, a one inch, a half inch, a quarter inch, eighth inch. And it comes in different densities. The density that we use is uh, 200 series, and that means it's uh, rated at 2.25 pounds per square inch or something like that. And, but it's, it's a good density for our work, okay? That uh, uh, F.220 is what product that we buy the most often. Um, it's, it's called it, Ethafoam? Yeah. E-T-H-A-F-O-A-M. Uh, but there are other polyethylene products out there. It just happens to be the one that we're buying right now. Uh, Dow makes the, the one that we're buying. Does this come in uh, sheets? Or? Yeah. Great big ones. They're uh, uh, just under nine feet long and four feet wide. And uh, you, know, you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, in this particular thing, this is a storage unit for a, a flat piece. Uh, it's been uh, heated with the, the really thin stuff there that's uh, kind of rolled up in front of you. It's, it's kind of a different color than the rest of them. And that's Valara. It's another polyethylene foam. Uh, so they're compatible. You heat them right together. And the thing we like about that is uh, the ethafoam block is great for shock, but it's a little bit abrasive. And so to go right up against the piece for storage and for, and for moving around the museum, we attach some Valara to it because it's really soft. This stuff? Yeah, yeah. And that eliminates the problem of, of the duration <coughs> in that. You can also uh, add a sheeting to it. On this particular sheet, uh, we've added Tyvek, which is uh, the white papery product there and there. And uh, ty Tyvek, you usually see on the side of a house when it's being uh, transformed and it says Tyvek. And this is the same product that this doesn't say Tyvek on it. Um, it's a, a, a product that, that is non abrasive and it works really well for certain kinds of things. And in this particular instance, we added it to the ethafoam with a hot glue gun that everybody has, and, and you can get it at the craft store. Um, easy to use and uh, makes, a, makes a nice, clean surface that if you don't want to have it on there. Uh, Tyvek is interesting too because it can be washed. This is the same product as that, but it's been laundered, and so it's a lot like fabric now. It feels a lot like a bed sheet, and that's handy uh, when you're dealing with something that has a particularly uh, sensitive surface and you don't want to uh, abrade it with the stuff right off the roll. Uh, it can be a little staticky too when you first roll it off, so you, you got to be careful of that, especially if you have something that's fibrous like that African piece that we're working on. You wouldn't want to get static next to that because bad things would happen. So um, the, the polyethylenes are something we, we like a lot here. Polyester is uh, 
something that I don't have out for some reason. But uh, you've got it at your feet there. It's that dark gray stuff. And uh, it's, it's good too. And this is, this is cushiony more so than the epiphone. Um, it can't be heated together like that. That wouldn't be good. Uh, but it can be added to other foam, And uh, it can also be used in concert with it without actually being attached to it. Um, this stuff is great for vibration. And so those are our two enemies, right? Shock and vibration. So you've got other foam working to deal with your shock. And then you've got this working to deal with your vibration. So it's a really good team. Uh, we've used this in a variety of ways. Sometimes you can uh, uh, glue it to a piece of ethophone and you've know, you got that going. Sometimes you can use uh, on the exterior and interior and uh, let one do one job. It's not inert like ethophone. You could probably eat ethophone. I mean, it wouldn't taste good, it would be scratchy. But I mean, it's, it's inert, so it's, it's got big colonies that way. And this is, this is pretty stable too. You don't see the discoloration or transfer of the junk and that sort of thing like that. Acid-free tissue and lens papers, that sort of thing, are good wraps <laughs> and, and barriers between your phones and stuff. Uh, you get a variety of, of uh, paper products there that you can see. Um, different boards that we use to build our inner boxes, foam boards, blue boards, acid-free boards, neutral pH boards, Okay, there's all kinds of stuff out there. You can use cardboard too. I use it to cover my tables. That way when I cut, I don't uh, cut my table surface. But you can use it for boxes, obviously. Uh, it's, it, we make our own boxes. Um, so, uh, that's something you can do as well. Cut the boxes and uh, Other things that are good for our wrapping and sealing are, are like uh, uh, plastic, clear plastic. Uh, we buy Visqueen which is just a product name, but it's a polyethylene sheet. So uh, polyethylene again comes into play. Uh, you can get it uh, in different qualities. Uh, the stuff we buy is called virgin because it's, it's uh, not recycled. It's, it's uh, straight from manufacturing. It has no impurities in it, but you can get the next step down. It has a few dimples or something in it, but it, it's, it's a good product and it's great for uh, moisture barriers. You know, you, you're not going to get your product wet if it's left out in the rain. So uh, it has that good quality about it. It's, it's a good cover for paints because it's not really going to stick to anything like that. Um, so polyethylene is good. Tie that we talked about. And uh, batting. Um, you've probably noticed it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Um, that batting that people use inside their quilts and uh, put around their Christmas trees is, is really good for certain uh, um, applications. It, it's a great little nest for things that are particularly light and fragile. Uh, and uh, you know, you probably want to put a barrier between it and the product too, because if, if it's got a tooth to it, it'll catch that fiber and, and pull it away. But it, it's, it's really forgiving, it's really soft. And you can hold things nice and easy with that. Uh, also, if you have like a deep carving and you want to put your cushion up against that front, but it's got all that deep stuff in there, you can put that in between your cushion and your object and <coughs> it'll fill in that space in a nice way. It's not going to damage any of the carving, but it'll kind of stabilize it. So it's, it's a seamstress tool that uh, we found and loved here in the packing department. I have a sewing machine too, by the way, but uh, that's another story. Um, so with all of these products, one of the things you can think of when you're, when you're choosing and selecting and applying is um, tight is not always right. And you can picture your artwork as an egg. And if you carry an egg across the, the lawn, you're holding it in your hand, right? And your hand it is serving a certain function, and so are your, your, the rest of your body. So you let your body take the shocks, and you're kind of keeping that, that safe and sound in there, and maybe a little vibration. And so you, you have those two things that work, shock and vibration, and, and that's how you keep that egg from breaking. If you squeeze it real tight, then you're done, and you can go home. 
So you, you want to keep that in mind if you're hardware too. Tight's not always right. I, I've had even museum professionals not understand that simple thing that, uh, you know, you don't want your cushioning to, to bear down on your artwork. You don't need to fill the whole crate with cushioning. Uh, you know, something like ethophone, uh, it would be like putting it on the sidewalk because yeah, it's, it's a dense foam. So you use it sparingly. You only need to support the weight. You don't need, you know, you don't need to build uh, the world out there. I thought that was my heart. So, <laughs> so, so that brings us to travel containers, right? And, uh, you know, travel containers um, are, are as varied as anything on Earth. And uh, one of the ways that I think about that is like our bodies. You know, you have your layer of skin, and you've got muscle underneath that, and you've got bone and you've got uh, membranous sacs around your organs, and all of that is, is serving to, to protect things inside. And that's fine for most everyday use. You know, usually you don't need anything in addition to your body to protect your organs. But if you get in certain, certain circumstances, you need body armor, right? You know, if you're gonna uh, be out there and have people shooting at you, and uh, you know, if you're gonna be shot out of a cannon, and stuff like that, you wanna put a helmet on. So, uh, the, the Artwork's body armor is either in the form of a crate or in the form of boxes. Um, we talked about uh, double boxes, and here's an example of, of that, um, where I've, I've used uh, polyethylene foam around an inner box to take care of the shop. So I can knock this thing or I can throw it against the wall if she wasn't sitting there, and uh, it, nothing would happen to it. And inside of that is another box. And within that box is our soft foam. And so that's taking care of the vibration. So all along the road, it's shaking and it's bopping and everything's good. Uh, one of the things you can do with that polyester is nice little contours like this. Uh, you think I just have an endless supply of coffee cups, don't you? <laughs> coffee jar. Cut out the contour and uh, you get this nice little thing going here. So, you know, that's easy to do. It's, it's, it's real easy to use. Uh, you can use a bandsaw or you can use a nice long knife like this and, and cut that out. And it doesn't take much time. Uh, if that's too much or your product not worth that much effort, you know, you can make square signs, put that in there, and maybe fill the void with some of this wrapping material. So, you know, but you're still doing the same thing. You're taking care of the vibration, taking care of the shock, and everything's working together like that. I told you we make our own boxes. This is one of the reasons, uh, or one of the ways, rather, that we use uh, the half-inch boards. This is a neutral package. It's not for storage, it's for shipping. But you just cut it out of a single sheet, fold it up, and you're ready to go, and you've got a nice little box. And uh, that works extremely well for uh, inside of our crates. If you're not up to making boxes, uh, you can buy boxes. You have a painting you want to ship. There are boxes like this that have different names. Uh, strong box is one that I can think of, and there are others that, that uh, follow this line. But it's kind of like a pizza box. It has a lid that flips open. This one is reinforced to try and uh, mitigate puncture. It comes with the cushions inside of it. It is wrapped in tissue and has all of that. So that, you know, a natural artifact came to us in this actual box. So that's something that's available to you in a lot of different locations. Uh, tubs are one of the things that are options. Uh, this kind we use occasionally. Mainly we don't ship with this, but when we go to someone's home, uh, we can take this with us and it's a real fast way to soft pack and we're going to transport it so it doesn't lock, so you wouldn't want that to go to the airport. Take your artwork out and put that back. And so, uh, but this is good for uh, transporting yourself. You can loop through it and, and uh, cinch that down with uh, ties if you want. They, they sell other versions that have locks. But, you know, you, you, there's always this variant. Uh, you can get as simple as this. 
little clear plastic totes that you put under your bed. You put your winter clothes in, and you can outfit that. And you know, let your imagination be open uh, and uh, use as, as, as much variety as you want to. Um, one of the things that, uh, <laughs> I'm losing all my papers now. One of the things that we uh, use our crates for is because things can go wrong, and even though there are uh, names on people's trucks and stuff, I'm not talking about anybody. This was uh, this is available. This was on the news, uh, so you know, think about that. Think about you know, is a box enough? Because <laughs> you know, maybe somebody will drive off the road. Maybe they'll drive into your pool. Uh, you know, maybe they'll throw your product over the fence. That went viral. I don't know if you guys saw that on YouTube or not. Yeah. Everybody saw it, didn't they? Poor guy. Uh, he'll never work in the <laughs> shipping business again. But things like that happen. Bad things happen. And so, uh, you know, maybe a crate is the way you want to go if this is really important to you. Now, at IMA, our crates are a lot like this. Um, this is uh, sort of a scaled down version of what we do. But it's got uh, a lot of aspects to it that we find really useful. I'm going to go back and forth. I hope it doesn't drive me crazy. Uh, but part of the design is in the way the sides fit together. It's called a double butt joint. And what that amounts to is the way that fits together Anything outside the crate, like rain, has to change direction like three or four times before it even gets into your crate. So it's a real nice waterproof. I did a paper for the uh, American Association of Museums on waterproofing, and we tested our crates against uh, like a typical uh, gallery crate from New York and a typical crate from Europe. I made watercolors and put them in the crates that were like basically identical in size. I took them to the men's shower, let it rain on there for 30 minutes. My co-worker thought I was crazy. Brought it out. Ours is bone dry. Some moisture in the gallery crate. European crate was a little damp. It was okay. I thought that's not very dramatic, right? 75% of the earth is water. So the plane goes down. It's going to go in the ocean. So I took it out to the lily house where we have a nice big pond. And I put the crates in the pond. Uh, Gallery crate sunk like a rock. Bubbles were gurgling and it went right to the bottom. Uh, the one from Europe took a little while, but it went down too. It was kind of gentle as it <laughs> floated to the bottom. Ours floated on top like ivory soap. Couldn't get it under the water. Went over to the rose garden, got paving stones, put it on top and held it underwater for 45 minutes. Brought it up after that. 30 minutes of rain, 45 minutes underwater, bone dry. After that, people as far away as Geneva wanted me to talk about this design. I didn't come up with it, but uh, I, what I do is I pick and choose what I think is the best and apply it here. And the museum gives me that uh, uh, ability. So a double butt joint is good stuff if you want to keep your stuff dry. It's a little extra work. Uh, we can go to the trouble of priming, filling our, our closures, sanding it, and then we uh, paint it with a a nice glossy paint because that repels even better. We use closure plates and rather than screws because we want our stuff to be used repeatedly. Uh, screws are good for a couple of trips and they start to get loose like old people's teeth. And uh, pretty soon you can pull that right up. And uh, so we want to avoid that. There are other things you can use besides closure plates. Uh, but anyway, that's the little story about our crates. And if that double butt wasn't enough, we use gaskets as well. And you can get gaskets at any hardware store, and they also come in a variety. And we attach those around the lip. This here is a flat gasket. That's adhesive on one side. Put that around your window, keep the winter out. Put that around your crate, keep all the bad stuff out. So that's the way that all works together. Um, inside of that, it's like that body I was telling you about, layer after layer of protection like the curse of the mummy you keep taking away and taking away got a layer of insulation we usually use two inches this is one inch for demonstration then there's the ethophone that takes care of the shock then there's an inner box and inside that 
is that soft foam and then the armor. So, uh, a layered approach that gives us what we think is a uh, high level of protection. Um, that's a lot of work, so maybe you don't want to go that far. This crate came to us from uh, New York, it contained a historic frame, not an actual artwork, but something for artwork. And they took a simpler approach to use similar materials. So you've got ethyfoam attached to the crate, used hot glue, put that on there, wrap the frame up in that plastic, and it made it here, it made it safe. So you don't have to go all out. They don't have any water protection in this crate. You can pour water right into it. But, you know, they did what they did. And you got here. And uh, this is real simple to make. If you've got a garage, you can make this crate. Um, this one here, I should tell you about. It kind of goes back to my original story about how this side up doesn't mean anything. This guy's really labeled, isn't he? You know which side is up because he's put arrows everywhere and he's written on it, you know, all this stuff, do not drop and fragile and all. And look at the gray marks all over. What do you think was the bottom in the truck? Was it that or was it over here where it's really dirty? It seemed like everything was the bottom except the bottom. And uh, took a nice hard blow there at some point in his life. Real art came in this. Uh, you know, I didn't make this crate. Uh, they've made it out of an existing crate. And the way I know that is because it has uh, some telltale signs on it. There's a part of a stencil showing right there. And that stencil is this stencil. And you have to have that on your solid wood if you're shipping beyond our, our border. Because there's a little devil called the pine wood nematode that probably all of you stay up nights and worry about. I know I do. The pine wood nematode is detrimental to pine trees. They don't want it in Europe, they don't want it in Canada, they don't want it in Mexico. If you ship past the border, in solid wood, you're going to have this. There are places in town that do it. Uh, they cost a little bit. Uh, or you could use something besides wood. But it's something to think about if you're shipping overseas. The other thing you think about now is uh, TSA. If you're putting something on a plane, then the TSA is going to have to go through it. You know how when you go to the airport and they make take shoes off and all that stuff that they do? All that's happening to cargo now. It's phase two of the 9-11 commission. So if you put it on a passenger plane, somebody's going through it. So that's another reason to make a good design for that guy I was showing. Okay, because... Even cargo. Yeah, plans. yeah. I just talked to him yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're not art handlers, believe it or not. They're TSA agents, and uh, they may not handle your art just the way you want them to. So plan for that. Okay, here's the inside of this crate. Very interesting to me. There's this cushy foam on the face. So maybe they did think it was going to be turned on the wrong side. Uh, but uh, it's got uh, styrofoam. This is actually is styrofoam around the other side. So that didn't offer a whole lot of cushion to this piece. This was a bust, by the way, a small uh, plaster bust that was painted. Um, interesting to me, very interesting design. Nothing up here. I didn't take that out, it was like that. Nothing up there. So I, I brought this box out and it says this side up adamantly, just like it did on the outside. Well I thought this guy had been turned upside down enough, so I tried to uh, obey their instructions. But the way they had taped it, on the bottom, and you couldn't get that off of there without ignoring this. So make sure that your wishes and your instructions match the reality of your package. Uh, you know, I finally got all the tape off, 
and uh, got inside this thing to see what was what. And, you know, what a strange way to open for a little bust. This bust is about this big. It was floating inside of all of this uh, tissue that they had. So you kind of had to lay it down to pack, unpack it properly or it would just roll out onto the floor and be damaged. So, uh, miraculously, that worked. So you can count on miracles. <laughs> yeah, that's your priority. Uh, or you can try and plan a little better. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorites. This predates 9-11. You wouldn't take this to the airport now. <laughs> but uh, it's just to illustrate that you can be creative. Uh, I made this to look like a suitcase because it was a hand carry, and in those days that was perfectly acceptable. We shipped uh, a bunch of jade in this, flat jade pieces from China, and uh, made this little carrying case, uh, just insert cushions and all that sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, really, there's, there's nothing you can't use to pack your artwork, as long as you're thinking about your enemies, shock, vibration, water, and human error. Um, you know, if, you, if you use your materials in sensible ways that uh, take all of your risk levels in mind, and that's what you need to think about. You know, what, what's your risk tolerance level? Just like you invest your money, you know, maybe you have this is good, you know, you're getting older, maybe that's good. Think that way about what you're willing to risk in terms of the artwork. Do you really want this to make it um, to last forever? Do you want it to come back in one piece? Travel frames are great for objects that don't have a frame or that have frames with weird stuff sticking out of it or that have frames that the artist has painted themselves. And what you do is uh, you attach the painting to that using uh, those bolts and, and uh, wing nuts, you have to attach something to the back of the object. And, uh, you know, like a Oz clip or a mini plate. And basically, a piece of metal with a hole in it is what we're talking about. It slips over the bolt, you tighten it down, your painting is mounted to that travel frame. That allows you then to cushion the travel frame and not the artwork because maybe the artwork is too fragile, the surfaces are too fragile, the frame is too fragile. Whatever the, the problem is, you uh, eliminate it by using the trap. The package is fragile and has a little champagne glass or something like a martini glass. Uh, very few packages actually have glass in them. But if you do have things with glass in it, that's a problem, isn't it? Because the glass breaks. Uh, you can put fragile on there and got to throw it over the fence. So, you need to think long and hard about glass. If you can substitute it with plexiglass, do that. If, if there's some reason that you're wed to the idea of glass, then maybe the thing to do is to take this out and pack it separately and pack your artwork in a different way. And then when it gets to its destination, you can put that back together again. You can't assure that glass won't break. Now you can use glass tape, you've probably heard of glass tape, and basically it's, it's tape that goes on the glass. Uh, it doesn't prevent breakage. It's, it's kind of like those commercials where they're selling uh, birth control, and then there's that little caveat that this doesn't prevent HIV. It's apples and oranges. It's the same with glass tape. Glass tape doesn't prevent breakage. It, it, what it does is when the glass breaks, it doesn't rattle around and cut your litho up or whatever your, your patent. So uh, don't be misled because it's called glass tape. But it's an interesting product. It comes in like two inch wide or all the way up to like this, which is ridiculous because you're more likely to break the glass trying to get that rolled on there. But uh, when you have really big things, it works. And what it does is, is just keep that glass from moving. It doesn't keep it from breaking. So glass is, is not good on the road, doesn't travel well.
what weird thing have I not shown you? <laughs> well, there's a story I need to tell you. Because uh, human error is the one enemy that we haven't talked that much about. And uh, sometimes it's not handling. Because, you know, that, that's a human error. You can unpack this cup and, and everything's fine. It's made it all the way across country. It's been unpacked properly. And then they both put it on the cart and drop it. That's one kind of human error. But the main kind of human error is inside a person's head. Um, we had an artist here, a living artist, brought his artwork to us himself, hand-delivered it, put it up on display, it was up for three months. At the end of the show, he decided, well, I'd like that shipped to New York. And I said, fine, we can do that. But he wanted it shipped in the boxes that he brought the pieces in. Well, he, he drove it like 10 minutes. And the box was really inadequate for anything but that. It made the 10-minute drive fine, but it wasn't going to go to New York. And it's, what do you call it, uh, low fire ceramics? You know, it's real brittle, kind of like a cookie almost. I mean, it just wants to break. It's, it lives its whole life wanting to break. And that's what this stuff does. And I, I, I told this guy, you know, look, this is never going to make it. It, it can't make the trip in this in this box. I said, I'll, I'll make any kind of box. I'll make a crate. I'm not going to charge you anything. But I'll pack it so that it makes it. For some reason, and I can only think obstinates and arrogance and stubbornness, he wouldn't hear of it. He demanded that it go to New York <laughs> in that ratty box. <laughs> on end. These pieces were on end. I said, it, it, it can't make it. And I, you know, I can't be a party to that. I can't, you know, first do no harm, right? I can't willingly do that. Uh, it went on and on, and finally, I, I told my supervisors, <coughs> I said, look, you know, I'm, this isn't fiction. This stuff is going to break on the road. Uh, I can't be liable for that. If he signs a waiver, it's the only way that I'll put it in that brain box. He signed a waiver. Now, what kind of stubbornness? would take you that far. I, I still to this day don't know why. Of course it broke. It arrived in New York broken. And he was outraged. <laughs> so uh, never forget your enemy, human error. Never forget that. Uh, you know, and, and it applies to us as well, because we can all be stubborn. But let's look at it and let's think about it and let's let's try to approach it in a, in a way that's using our brain and, uh, and we'll have happy results then. Obviously,